Now, the other as things that we can see inferior to the brain is a small gland that's suspended from the brain that's called the pituitary gland or hypothesis. So you'll recall when we did the sphenoid bone, we learned an area called the cella tersica, and the depression in the cella tersica was the hypophyseal fossa. And so what sits in the hypophyseal fossa is the pituitary gland or hypothesis. Now it's suspended from the, from the brain by a little stalk, and the stalk that suspends the pituitary or hypothesis from the brain is called the infundibulum. So once we find the infundibulum, we can move backward, posterior to that, and we'll find a, a large uh, white bump. If we put the brain together and we look down in this groove, we can actually see that there are actually two of those white bumps. And so those are, those are called mammillary bodies that we're seeing down here in the groove and then they would be next to that area we were talking about, which was the cerebral peduncles. So what we're going to talk about now is what the functional aspects are of our cerebral cortex and cerebral hemispheres. So we're going to start with this colored brain because it's been mapped out for us in color, and then we're going to transfer this to an uncolored brain. So the frontal lobe has uh, a number of different functions, which is why it's got three colors on it, the red, the pink, and the yellow. So our purpose is for this class, we're not going to worry so much about the yellow area, but it's, got a, it's very important to mood and behavioral patterns, which is why in insane asylums in the past, they used to do frontal lobotomies, and they would simply remove this part of p a patient's brains who were very aggressive and violent and then they lost all those behavior patterns. So you may have watched a movie called One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest where they did a frontal lobotomy. Uh, but if we look at the red area, uh, the red area, which is again the precentral gyrus, is what we call the primary motor area. And this area is responsible for initiating all skeletal muscle activity. And what we're going to see is in the brain we have primary areas which are the initial areas. And then we have association areas, which the pink area is. So it could be referred to as the motor association area. And some people refer to it as the premotor area. And this is where we store all of the sequential skeletal muscle contractions that we have learned in walking, running, riding a bike, swimming, throwing a ball. And so what we would see clinically is patients who have strokes that impact areas of this pink areas of the brain will forget how to do certain tasks. And then physical therapists and occupational therapists work with those patients to actually try to recover some of those tasks. So, so this is where we would store like tying our shoe. And so it's not uncommon for patients who had strokes that involve this frontal lobe of the brain have forgotten how to tie their shoes and have to be retrained to tie their shoes. And other neurons then have to be trained to actually take over for the neurons that died during the stroke event. So as we move posterior on the brain, remember our landmark is our central sulcus. The gyrus posterior to that that's colored blue here is our post-central uh, gyrus. And then the rest of the green area here is the rest of our parietal lobe of our brain. And our parietal lobe is a sensory area of the brain. So sensory input from skin, muscle, bones, uh, comes back initially to this blue gyrus, which is our primary somatosensory area of the brain, and then our, our memory in relationship to those sensations is stored within the rest of our occipital lobe of our brain, which is called the association area, somatosensory association area. So again, patients that would have strokes that would involve the somatosensory area of the brain would lose the ability to interpret sensations so that they don't have the capacity to actually uh, interpret certain sensations. They have to be retrained to do that as well. Uh, as we move posterior, then remember internally we can see it more, clear, more clearly, but we have the parietal occipital sulcus that separates the parietal lobe from the 
occipital lobe of the brain, and the occipital lobe of the brain is visual. So our, all of our information coming back from our eyes is going to be interpreted by the occipital lobe of the brain. And so when we look at the dark blue area on this model at the back, that's the primary area. So the sensations coming back from your eye arise, uh, arrive at the brain in this area. And then everything you've learned re relative to visual input is stored in this association area called the, the visual association area of the brain. So for example, when you were young, you learned colors, uh, the color red, the color yellow, the color blue that we're talking about here. And where you have retained that memory is in this light blue area. So patients who have strokes or trauma to the posterior aspect of the brain can forget uh, uh, visual input. So for example, they could forget their family member's face because that face is interpreted in this area of the brain. So post-stroke, you could have a patient that doesn't remember their family members by visual uh, input because this area has been damaged. Now as we move to the temporal lobe of the brain, then the temporal lobe of the brain has a very important function in memory that we'll talk about in lecture with an area called the hippocampus, which is an internal area here. What we're interested in right now is this little blue area, and notice it's inferior to the lateral uh, sulcus of the brain, and then the dark green area around it. So this blue area is our primary auditory area, so that's what you're using while you're listening to my voice right now. And so the, the impulses from the ear go here first on the, on the cortex of the brain. And then this is a memory area where we learned what different sounds sound like uh, at, when we were learning the patterns of speech. And so that is stored in this area as well. So a patient who has a stroke in this area of the brain would have a failure of interpreting uh, sounds and speech until they, had to, until they relearned that again. So what we're going to do now is we're going to look at the internal aspects of the brain. So what we're looking at is a mid-sagittal section of the brain. And what we'll notice is there's a large white structure that is crescent moon-shaped in the brain. And that's called the corpus callosum. And the corpus callosum is a connector to the two sides of the hemispheres, to the left and right hemispheres. Uh, if we look at the corpus callosum, there's a downward-oriented uh, white thing that's called the fornix. And then there's actually a membrane that exists between the corpus callosum and the fornix anterior, which is called the septum pellucidum. So the reference to septum is that it's separating something into left and right sides. And if we were to cut cut this, we would actually see that there's actually a space behind it. So in this model, if we pull it apart, we, we can actually see that there's a space right here in the brain. And it's, it, it's referred to as a lateral ventricle. So what we would see is that the septum pellucidum here is separating that space called the lateral ventricle. Now the best way to actually see that space is with a CAT scan or an MRI uh, that's a frontal or coronal section. So what we're looking at here is a frontal section uh, or coronal section of the brain. So to orient ourselves, what we were looking at on the model, this is a longitudinal fissure that separates the hemispheres into left and right hemispheres. This is the lateral sulcus that's separating the parietal lobe from the temporal lobe. And then this is the insula that that innermost uh, lobe of the brain. And so what we were just referring to was the corpus callosum, which as you can see clearly in a frontal view is connecting the left and right hemispheres. And then extending off of that is a thin membrane called the septum pellucidum. This large white thing at the bottom of it was the fornix we talked about. And what we can see is the septum gets the name septum because it's actually separating two spaces that we have in our vein brain called ventricles. And so this is the left and right lateral ventricles, which are found in the, the, the cerebral hemispheres of the brain.
What we were just doing was the corpus callosum, the fornix, and then the septum pellucidum that runs between the corpus callosum and the fornix. If we find the fornix and we move downward or inferior from it, we reach an elevated area right here, which is the intermediate mass of the, th of the thalamus. So the area behind it is the thalamus, which is a very important sensory relay area. The intermediate mass is, again, a connector connecting the left and right sides of the thalamus. And again, it can be most easily seen uh, by using a frontal view on a CAT scan. Unfortunately, the one we were just looking at is too posterior to it, so we won't be able to see it. But in, in the lecture, there's actually an x-ray that you can look at that, that clearly shows it for you. As we move down from this area called the thalamus, we, there's a triangular area just below it which is referred to as the hypothalamus. And the hypothalamus, if we look at the other side of the model, is actually what the infundibulum is connected to and the pituitary gland. So the hypothalamus is actually the most important area of your brain for maintaining homeostasis. So remember in the first test, we asked, I, we asked the question, what two organ systems are involved in homeostasis? And the answer was the nervous system and the endocrine system. And the hypothalamus is the area that controls the uh, part of the nervous system involved in homeostasis, the autonomic nervous system, and, involved, and uh, controls the endocrine system. So this is actually the seat of homeostasis which is why it is very inferior in the brain, sitting above the cella tersica, of the sphenoid bone, so that it's, it's very well protected. Now, as we find the intermediate mass and move posterior to it, we have a little pink gland that sits above the corpora quadrigemini we just looked at, and at the end of the corpus callosum. So this little pink gland is called the pineal gland, and the pineal gland produces two hormones, serotonin and melatonin, which are involved in controlling day and night patterns in, in humans and inducing sleep. So as we move posterior to uh, the pineal gland, we're looking at the internal aspect of the cerebellum. And if you look at it, it looks like there's a little tree inside your brain. So the white matter of the cerebellum uh, is referred to as the arbor vitae. So arbor is a reference to tree. So all of these branches are the arbor vitae. And then the gray matter folds that we see that make it look like the leaves of the tree are called fola. One of the things that we do is we produce a liquid called cerebral spinal fluid. And the cerebral spinal fluid is maintained inside of the meninges that we talked about in the subarachnoid space. So what we're going to talk about now is where cerebral spinal fluid is produced and how it moves from the internal aspects of the brain to the subarachnoid space and then eventually uh, surrounding the brain and spinal cord where it creates a buoyancy and protects us from mechanical trauma to our brain and spinal cord. So when you look at these models, there's a, a blue pattern that are in the models, and this represents a capillary bed. So the capillary beds that are responsible for producing cerebral spinal fluid are called choroid plexes. And we would have choroid plexes in, a, in several places within the brain. So remember that the septum pellucidum, as we looked at in that CAT scan, is actually separating two spaces that are, uh, again, posterior in the brain. So the space that we're seeing here, which is a lateral ventricle. So each lateral ventricle has a choroid plexus.